Good evening and welcome to Die and the Wool Podcast. I am your host, Justin Peterson, and I'm here uh, once more to, I guess, just run my mouth. I kind of wanted to um, brainstorm with y'all right now about uh, about Thomas H. Perkins, right? Now, my last video I left off, and all I, all I said was a few things about the histographical uh, kind of study, I guess, or problems. And I, as I have reanalyzed my thoughts and kind of came back to uh, what I what I know, and after listening to a few more things on my uh, on my own research time, I've kind of decided that I needed to fully describe to you the um, I guess the historiography of Thomas Perkins, which is almost non-existent. Um, and I'm serious when I say that it is almost non-existent because very few things appear about him. Like, you know, his life's hard to find outside of his archives um, at, you know, the Massachusetts State Historical Society or even Harvard, right? But nonetheless, um, nonetheless, it's just hard to find things about him. In fact, even as, as late as 2007, uh, when his name does appear in, in some of the newer studies, they're not really, you know, trying to trying to get him. They're trying to get his industry. However, even one, like I said, in 2007, went so far as to say that he didn't do what he did, you know. And, and so the, the confusion that comes about with Thomas Perkins is actually kind of interesting because as I listened to a podcast just recently um, with Tom Luongo and uh, Richard Poe, uh, I came to the idea or the conclusion that I wasn't connecting my information in a, the right way or kind of the correct way that it should be or that it should sh- kind of shed light on this uh, this story because it kind of changed changed my mind and I knew the surrounding details of this. I knew where I could, you know, kind of place everything else. However, I've not been able to place Thomas Perkin because some of the stuff that I have is conflicting in a way that they're, they're half right. They're, uh, what their assumption or the conclusion comes down to you know, they get halfway there, and then they get halfway wrong because they don't take an account for uh, some of the things that were going on in Europe during the same period, or even after, right? Even after when the when the, the second historiography of American history was written, or the, revised the first one, there was a power struggle amongst the, uh, the, uh, the, the round table, so to speak, or the, the shadow, um, you know... Uh, governments in a way that they were kind of directing things the way they wanted it. and and i kind of have an idea why and uh and so let's kind of talk about that i may not be 100 percent yet there's a lot that still goes in kind of to to what i would like um to get at really because the study is hard because what my study is right is that it's on um it's entitled it's entitled the perkins enigma finding america's shadow now, finding America's shadow is interesting because that in, in, in includes the idea that you know somebody other than the president or the senate or uh, you know or even as we say we the people right were running the country right and it, it, it kind of you know you kind of look at this idea that somebody else was calling the shots and that's the case with Thomas Perkins he admitted to it he said so. Right, and I've discussed that in my last video. If you want to watch the video, I've, I've discussed some of the books that that talk about that. Even you know, you Caleb Cushing did the same thing, and his fingerprints are really all over the war between the states. You know, uh, <laughs> and you kind of, and again, this is where do I place Cushing in itself? Because Cushing is family to Perkins; he is an heir. You know, you have John Perkins Cushing, the nephew of Thomas Perkins, right? Thomas H. Perkins, sorry. If you look up Thomas Perkins on the uh, interweb now, you'll find the latest heir who just recently passed away, who also said that you should praise the rich for giving you things, right? And so it makes it kind of awkward with that. But nonetheless, right, we have a lot to, to kind of, uh, I guess, go over with this. And so I'm going to briefly, very, very, very briefly, uh, we're going to talk about this introduction, right? And so... Um, what the introduction is called is the introduction, the devil of the details, right? The devil of the details. And it talks about that, you know, the, the, um, when we kind of go over this. So when we look at the details, that's where we find Thomas Perkins. We don't find him in the grand picture, uh, with exception of very few. And ever since American history has been revised, uh, we kind of have this, this non-existent person, um, 
outside of what's recently, like very recently, been discovered. And that's only if this had this had never been a problem, um, it wouldn't have been studied. But it is a problem, and it's a very big problem. Is that we had the opioid crisis, right? I'm sure all of us know at least one or two people that have been uh, truly, truly affected by the uh, um, by the opioid crisis. So uh, it it kind of talks about this idea of why was he why was he missing? Why is he missing? You know, it says that the disappearance of Thomas H. Perkins from the post '60s historiography is much like Richard Elliot Friedman's observation of Nietzsche's concept of God dying. A separation from our foundation due to voluntary madness developed from one section's philosophical crusade now sweeping away the ashes of the American Republic. Right? The self-inflicted madness um, is a product of a lot of things. It's a product of education. It's a product of uh, just the general sense of history because we like to we like to not overlook things. We like to underlook things and, and, and look at it and go, all right, what is the easiest thing for me to understand? Oh, there's this word and this word and this word, and that lines up with my present-day beliefs. And so, therefore, it lines up with uh, my ideas. And so I can feel different, which feelings are, are, are you know, not not really a, a worthwhile aspect of studying things. Um, and so that's always the one thing is we feel things and we can't unbiasedly look. Well, some people can. You know, I like to, to get as close as I can to unbiasedly looking at things. Because, um, and that's just by laying things on the table, right? So, if we look at this, right, we look at the fact that the historiography in itself is split up into four, uh, four different sections, right? And so, you have your first section, which is over here. You have your first section, and that's the section when... These men lived, right? We like to think that, you know, 20 years later is history. However, we're so far removed from this, this sense, I should say, from this person, that now we have to rely on this as being part of his, his historiography. So this is where we get the majority of, I guess, the information on him, right? And so we look at it, right? And so this takes place between 1830 and 1900. That's kind of where the baseline of this study has done. It's the primary source era. The, uh, as I call it, when giants live, because they lived. And now, there's nothing more important to history than the words of the people that actually lived it, because we can't change that. We can't impose our views onto that. No matter how hard we try, we have to understand that, you know, what they said is what they said. Right? Now, a lot of people are going, well, you know, some of the other videos, they, they said what they said. Um... You know, and, and, and it's true, because then we also had to do what we like to call contextualize. Frame it correctly. Um, sorry, I had to adjust that wire. Um, frame it correctly, and that's the case of this, is to frame a lot of the things that we misframe, um, and to put it back into, into that correct aspect, right? And so you find a lot of things, you find him in there. Uh, the first study on him was by a man named Thomas G. Carey. Josh, Thomas G. Carey, he did the best he could with what he had. You know, this book was written in, um, when is it, the mid-1800s, right? And so what he did is he took essentially Perkins' writings and he said, here you go. Here is his writings. Let's study this man, right? And this this tells of a lot of things because then we start to see the, the story of Perkins. We start to see where he got his rise, when he got his rise, who gave him his empire, um, and we kind of see where he, like, if, if we look at, like, you know, say the XYZ affair, um, or that quasi-war with France that's always talked about, it's kind of like the first big conflict coming out of the, uh, revolution that we like to, we like to talk about, and it's kind of how they think, like, they frame John Adams' story in that, is we have to look at it and go, well, where was Perkins during that time? He was in France. He was awaiting the government to hear about his contract, um, when he was meeting with a lot of high-powered people, one of which, uh, if we look at a quote by uh, by Maurice de uh, Talleyrand, right, is that, um, you know, obviously one of those guys that he met was him at one point, which would have seemed awkward when we go into the XYZ affair because it does, when they came back, sound rather illogical and lacks detail and, and just continuity and thought, right? It, it, it just seems awkward that it's there. Uh, and nonetheless, you know, we settled with France eventually, and uh, it worked out well for the merchants. 
Who'd have thought, right? Um, and so, sorry, Charles Maurice Tally, de Talleyrand. I, I always get to I forget about Charles all the time. Um, and so you you have that, right? Then you have you know people like. Uh, Mercy, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, who does indicate at some point in her writing, it's very early in the writing, where she says, you know, hey, there was some questionable details uh, about, you know, what got us to the revolution. And that indicates a lot of things that, you know, his grandfather, um, his grandfather Thomas Peck would have done, and even at one point his father. And so, uh, there, you know, that's, that's evidence of him. That's evidence of him completely in there. Uh, if we look at that, right, um, and then you have Robert Bennett Forbes, which, you know, we've talked about that kind of stuff all over the place, uh, last video, and you have, um, you have Solomon Day Rothschild, who, who does talk about this idea of labor and helps us reframe the labor, because it helps us kind of put this idea on, uh, on Perkins, um, that he was the guy building up industry, building in credit. Right, and therefore it was, you know, more productive for him to have free labor because free labor would get people to buy things on credit, more loans, and uh, so on and so forth. So it, it, it was an aspect, you know, Thomas Prentice Kettle talks about it. Lysander Spooner, uh, he actually calls out the European financiers, but I think he was looking at the bigger picture as opposed to, um, you know, the kind of direct sectional conflict that had just taken place. Uh, which is actually kind of important because when we pull in the information here in a second and, and kind of uh, uh, talk about it, right? It's we 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 see some 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 challenges here for for England, uh, essentially trying to uh, recolonize, if that's a, a good framing word. I, I don't know. I'd, I'd probably re uh, reestablish their rule over uh, America, right? And so that's that's another aspect of it. Um, you know, like I said, we have the Caleb Cushing book, which talked about that. Caleb Cushing was very open about the, a lot of things that were going to happen. When he got to a point where he was for, uh, foreshadowing what was going to happen, uh, he did talk about a lot of this, right? He did talk about the war and industry and, and how that would, um, you know, would be something that would cause a war, right? Then uh, as we get closer to that, we have Henry Cabot Lodge. Um, you know, they're talking about Boston. Same thing, another thing with Caleb Cushing. They're talking about Boston. They're talking about the men that, that created the, uh, um, you know, the country, right? Uh, and then you have other things like, uh, <laughs> where it is, uh, Tappan, right? Lewis and Arthur Tappan. Um, Lewis Tappan in this particular in, uh, sense. He does talk about this, this point in history where it's called the Unitary Takeover of Harvard. Which we have to admit is, is arguably one of the most crucial points in American history because it did philosophically shift everything, right? It 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 re it refounded that European Hegelism, um, you know, that they would then turn around and and, and you know found their their idea of communism on, um, and so it would be the the home base of, of Marx, right? Marx would be that um, uh, that British kind of British agent, I guess, so to speak. Uh, planting that, and that would be where he founded a lot of his work. Um, and so we have this, and, and Lewis Tappan, he does say that the richest men in Boston were funding this Unitarian takeover because in turn, it, you know, you have the ref, the reformers that we talk about, right? You have the people, oh, we're, you know, moving into the, um, the free, uh, the free states, so to speak, the free states, um, sorry, the, the wage labor, the wage slave labor. Right, that's what we'll actually call it because that's what it is. Um, and so a lot of the richest men in Boston were also shipping people over to these areas to help uh, spur on their idea in the cons in their state constitutions. And on top of that, it, it is you know a little uh, conspicuous the fact that a lot of those areas there have names after the richest men in Boston. Uh, and so we can kind of go back and forth on that idea, but free labor really means. Uh, wage, you know, wage slavery, wage labor, right? Uh, and us working for uh, these financiers. And so that was a big deal because, uh, you know, we're they're industrializing. They're kind of pushing around a lot of things. They needed a raw material factory, which is why we have the, the South kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of getting stuck in the feudal system, which as Kara Quigley said, survived a lot longer for some odd reason. We know why. Because it was artificially propped up. It was funded. It was loaned, right? We talk about, um, 
you know, these men having a lot of money. Realistically, it was a, a debt-based operation, right? You, you, you gathered loans, you gathered your things, you hoped that that harvest would, uh, you know, pay back that loan and allow you to get, a, you know, either another one or allow you to, to kind of buy a little more than you had. So it was a raw material factor, which is where a lot of the protection tariffs come from because it's, it's, it was preventing Europe from coming back over here, right? And so now you kind of see during this era, which is why the, the when they lived, it was so important um, because you start to see this conflict, right? You have David Christie's book, uh, Cotton as King, and then you have um, Henry Carey, uh, who ended up being, um, you know, New England's New England's kind of economist in the Lincoln administration that talks about this. It talks about that uh, Europe wants this back. They had the South locked in mercantilism anyway, uh, which is why a lot of people were sending, uh, which is why they were sending their, their product, you know, to Europe and why kind of it was allowed to exist a lot longer. Um, but there was a battle over the South. There was a battle to uh, reclaim the South as theirs. Um, and so this is where we can kind of frame Perkins. Perkins can be framed in the idea that he was at war with a kingdom. And why not, though? He was the richest merchant in, the, in, in I, I'd argue, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, he, he monopolized the opium trade. He uh, monopolized the credit system. Uh, he, you know, the, he outwitted. He was four steps ahead of the financiers every single time. Um, and so you have that idea that uh, uh, this is kind of the upper class, obviously. But some people from the upper middle class can play the game just as well. Right, and so when you see this, you go, okay, now we have a correct framing. And this took me a while, and this is why I'm kind of brainstorming because I might come back and and revisit this video and realize that I messed some things up, and that's fine, right? That's fine because we we we're always constantly growing in our research. Um, and so when it comes down to when historians desire truth, is what I call this section, you have this 1900 to 1950 slash 60, right? Realistically, the first uh, historiography of American history goes up from goes from 1900 to 1950, right? Then you have a transitioning period between 1950 uh, and 1980, where it, it's kind of this this falling uh, falling ideology, this philosophical change, um, or as we can call it now, because we know kind of who was involved with this. Uh, this was a color revolution. This was a a, a uh, postmodern color revolution where we had to constantly critique everything uh because well it either offended them or they knew that it would make people i guess less intellectual less willing to ask tough questions less willing to look at economic reasons because we feel so bad for some people um and so that's kind of what stops us from really getting smarter uh because a lot of the the postmodern stuff if you look at jaffa and foner and blythe and uh, Hofstadter and, and uh, even early Eugene Genovese, you know that a lot of things that they said uh, were embellished or incorrect, um, and it had some purpose behind it. You know, we look at Foner, who's the, the Reconstruction guru, and we realize that, well, a lot of his arguments have been defeated. A lot of his arguments are old and outdated. Uh, but yet you, you walk outside to some protesters and they're still running with this argument, even though they're about 40 years over over date, overdue to be beaten. And they're beaten. Um, you look at Philip Lay's Southern Reconstruction. That's a great one. Right. But you don't have to go that far in a new history. Again, you can go back to this 1830 to 1900 period and you can find tons of evidence that, you know, make those historians seem like idiots. Um, in part for the fact that they're philosophers and not historians. Uh, and then so you start to see this next one, right? So William Babcock Whedon, he was uh, kind of the first one to take on the idea of statistical uh, evidence, at least in this period. His book was in 1890, so I'm going to tack on a pre-10-year period, right? But then you have Terry L. Anderson, who also did the same thing in 1929. So this kind of established this era of economics, right? We call it, They call it the progressive era. Um, you know, the school of Wisconsin is where they uh, say kind of the start to come out of. But we started to look things at a uh, at a statistical or economic concept, right? Babcock and Anderson they looked at Boston because the biggest anomaly today is how did a, a small town or village 
go from that, just on the coast, a fishing village, so to speak, to a metropolis, right? An early metropolis is not the same thing. Where, you, know, you don't have the skyscraper and stuff like that. But you start to see bigger buildings. You start to see more money. Um, and you start to see more industry and just blow up, especially at a time when their, their economic issues were consuming them. They needed to change. They had a lot of problems because, they one, they needed to rely on another section to survive them, and two, they, they couldn't grow capital. They couldn't expand their capital because not a lot of it was coming in. There wasn't enough opportunity to make that grow. So they needed the Industrial Revolution, which was funded by opium, because it also saved that deficit that was um, that was happening. Because as they traded out, um, you know those things that were trading out weren't equaling what was coming back in, and so we uh, will have an economic problem if that's the case. Um, and I explained that before too, right? And then so you have the next person, Charles and Mary Baird, you know, husband and wife, who have done a great job uh, economically looking at things and economically destroying a lot of these postmodern arguments. However, we call him a socialist because he wasn't for this national concept. Um, but he also looked at this idea um, that there was really more uh, than what we want to uh, say, so to speak, right? There, there's not that slavery issue. It was economic. Um, and it wasn't just economic because, oh, a lot of people say, well, the slave system, the plantation system brought in a lot of money and uh, made a lot of planters rich, and therefore uh, it determined the policy of the country. None of that is true. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Uh, the back half of that's not true. Planters did make money, uh, but it was a debt-based operation, so we can argue all day long, and I'm open to this argument, of how much money did they actually make. Um, because there are a lot of books that do try to address this problem, and they do try to understand that maybe it's not as much money as we think. Um, you look at Natchez, Natchez found, found millionaires, but you also got to see who they were connected to. Someone like Stephen Duncan, so to speak. Stephen Duncan was a banker above all else. Uh, and so we do we do got to argue that, I said. And that's, a, that's for another time because a lot of people are too biased on their aspect because they want it to be profitable because they want it um, to determine or support their conclusion for, uh, for the cotton is king theory, which is a fairly new theory. They called it cotton is king. Uh, but you see, even statistically, if we look at like Thomas Quinn's kettle, uh, we can kind of challenge that idea, but we have like Frank, um, what was it, Frank Lawrence Alzi? I believe that's his name. Uh, don't quote me on that because it could be backwards for some reason. Um, but he took on that idea that cotton is king, and he spent a lot of time in England studying that. And so we're kind of looking at that idea. Um, but Charles Baird, he questioned the the integrity, I should say, of a lot of things that were happening in Boston post uh, pre revolution. He questioned the integrity of the, even the constitutional. Uh, uh, convention that it was brought on by one section, which I believe Patrick Henry said, you know, uh, he smells a rat, uh, it, give or take. I, I found the quote, and I'm trying to support that, and I hope that someone finds that quote, because if you find it, let me know. I'd love to see where that was from, because I do want to uh, kind of put that in a lot of things, right? And so um, then you have another, another aspect of this, right? Uh, you have historian S.E. Morrison. Morrison would actually kind of name agents in this, where he, he looks at the Bostons in the Hawaiian Islands, right? The Boston the Hawaiian Islands, the Boston merchants of the Hawaiian Islands, we know that all through time until this happened, it was New England merchants, right? Who was, who was the ones that, that uh, took over the kingdom? New England missionaries, New England merchants who paid for it, right? But we look at it, right, the first, you know, kind of contract um, that we had with Boston Merchants at King Kamehameha the first, right, the agent for it was John Perkins Cushing. At the time, John Perkins Cushing was the owner of Perkins and Company, um, and he acted as the, the kind of that next man next to Thomas Perkins. Um, and you also have that at the same time was Robert, Robert Bennett Fords, who were both acting there as uh, as the next, next you know, right-hand men of... Uh, of Perkins, so we know that the the you know kind of we see his fingerprints here, and we know why, right? It was that stopping point between the western coast of the North American continent and the uh, opium trade. So there we have that one. So that's kind of a, a one where during this period you at least see his name, right? 
Uh, and then here you'd have two. You'd have uh, Charles C. Steele and Jock M's Down, who they would actually kind of narrate the uh, creation of the opium trade, but they wouldn't do so much as to uh, talk about his influence, to talk about him in general. Again, it is his industry, very little of him, and then that's it. That's all you get. You know, And, and they're great studies. Don't get me wrong. He, they, they did fantastic jobs uh, labeling at the uh, opium trade, especially that early with uh, struggling to have access to a lot of the information. Um, right. And so I'll, I'll speed this up a little bit. You know, there's no sense in going with, like through all this, right? Then you have a transitionary period. In transitionary period, you finally see one whole book outside of Perkins or Carey that uh, would actually talk about his life and him and talk about the things that he did and talk about, you know, everything beyond the opium trade. And that was, um, that was by a man named Carl Seberg, who I, I, from what I can tell, was a uh, Unitarian, naturally, a preacher. And so he really did the world a lot of good because it was great um, information on him. It was a great research book. I'm still reading it right now, but so far I, I've been uh, amazed that even during this period, when archives were not as accessible, he managed to get them. However, during this period, we start to see why uh, the history was revised. Okay, and so this brings me to next point. This is why I want to brainstorm you, brainstorm with you. Ultimately, is that uh, during this period, right, Goldwater, Robert Taft first, and then Goldwater would face off against the uh, the the New England uh, Republicans, I so to speak for lack of a better word, their financers really what they were. But, um, and so they would beat a man named Nelson Rockefeller. Nelson Rockefeller was the brother of the heir uh, to the Rockefeller kingdom. John D. the Third and Nelson Rockefeller spent a lot of time after 1964 trying to figure out, one, how never to let the old right reappear, and two, how to make sure we establish uh, a rule in this country that is European in nature, right? That that reestablishes the, as we say, the round table um, and never having a Perkins or the old right who is the old conservative and doesn't, uh, doesn't kind of go forward in that aspect, right? And so Nelson Rockefeller would rewrite all of history. He paid for Harry Jaffa. Harry Jaffa even wrote uh, Goldwater's speech, which was the speech that they'd say honestly killed him. Um, and not killed him, you know, literally, but figuratively in a sense of losing that. Um, and so this is why, right, now coming out of that era, when you have that transitional area, then the next era, uh, the postmodernism, right, you you see this aspect. You see it revised. And and you got to know why, I guess. I, I, I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, but you see this aspect of, of Rockefeller kind of making sure that none of this happened. None of this none of this stuff. Like George Bundy was a part of this too, which is why our education system, by the way, in case you want to know, uh, is falling apart because this whole thing is built around Heigl. It's built around European, you know, Heigelism or Marxism. It's to make the individual weaker and the community um, I don't want to say smarter because they're not. Uh, the community uh, more subservient to the uh, to the masters, the elites. Um, and so that's why you have like Richard Hostetter's uh, community consensus, as I call it, uh, where historians come together and they, they form this community, they form this uh, identity, I'd say, this national identity, um, which is why we have this democracy and nationalism. Um, and that's what we study because they're building the American identity, not the, the actual, you know, uh, founding identity that we had, which was the Federal Republic, but to build this idea that we're all one people, uh, we need to find a common memory, um, because nobody else besides the elite are smart enough to remember anything, and, and naturally so, right, because, uh, that was the thought back then, that's why history was created in the first place as a discipline, because they thought it was for the elites because they felt that the uh, common person, which we know it's wrong, by the way, don't, I mean, naturally, when I say naturally so, it's not because I'm like, oh, naturally so, because we're dumb. We're not. We have the capability to do uh, wonderfully amazing things, and, and we should not be afraid of, of researching people like these and pointing out the, the evils uh, in this world. But uh, 
we have this aspect of that. And so, like I said, I, ch I challenged one, uh, one doctor, one doctor on this, and he, he said we shouldn't challenge the, uh, the consensus because if they say it in the consensus, guess what? We don't get to ask questions because they're always right. And so that's why. That is why we have what we have and we study what we study. Um, and so we go on, right? And, this late, and then the later area of this, right, uh, it kind of turned against them because while we have a constant critique of everything, we start to see more of Perkins. Um, again, they don't connect any of the information. They don't connect this question, but they talk about him more often. And so that's where they kind of made a mistake, I guess, in this aspect. But this is where I want to talk to you guys. Um, in this recent podcast that I listened to, this gentleman, Richard Poe, would, would say that uh, England's intent was to get the South back and use the South to uh, de-industrialize the North, hopefully through war. And everybody thought this at the time that, um, you know, if secession happened, right, the North would be cut off from all their resources and supplies, that they would challenge, uh, or they would not be able to get things, and they would hope that, uh, you know, they would need, even them would need England, because, you know, I, England did, did ship a lot of finished cotton back, and they were impacted for, for a year or so. Um, and so that's why, like, Jefferson Davis's idea of trickle-out never really worked. But at the same time, Jefferson Davis's trickle-out was kind of awkward, because it was just a bad idea in the first place, right? If they wanted to get money, they should have sent it all out. But there was, again, there was more things going on in the South than we know about. Uh, and if we look at the story of Albert Pike and 33-degree uh, uh, Masons and stuff like that, we can kind of bring up other arguments. They call them fringe or conspiracy. However, we have enough academic uh, evidence to support that they're not fringe or conspiracy. Uh, and so, my idea so to speak, is the fact that Thomas Perkins, or and his heirs, obviously, because Perkins died in uh, 1854, so I'm not fully saying it was Thomas Perkins. Thomas Perkins initiated it, but I think that the Perkins family kept it going because it was their empire. Um, and so they were, the, they were the industrialists, and they needed also the South as a raw material factory. However, the ultimate, the, the war between the states was over the concept of whose raw material factory the South would be. Um, and so we see a lot of drastic things. We can we know that Lincoln went to war with financiers, uh, not not judging or not not kind of letting him have a, a, a free, you know, excuse to to kill a million people because that's absolutely outrageous. Um, but this is where it, it's it's kind of coming together, I should say, um, that there was that war between the two the two tables, right? Uh, and ultimately, the one table would go so far as to prevent England from coming back onto this continent, the, the Monroe Doctrine, right? Coming back on this continent that it was more useful to have war, have absolutely uh, complete carnage or destruction, and then reconstruct it into their fashion so that it would be their raw material factory, so that it would be a place where uh, all those products came up north from here, right? Why did the, the was the free versus slave state argument? Well, that's dumb, right? We know we know that, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, it wasn't the, the perpetuation of slavery, because everybody knew at the time there were natural limits. Uh, Nobody was leaving the water tables or rivers, right? So we can we can kind of throw that out. I think I talked about that in my last video, but the fact of the matter is, is that free labor was more useful and easier to subdue, right? There were four million people in the South that weren't playing his game. Um, England didn't want them to play the game, but there were four million people that could have been playing Perkins' game. And so, was this war that? Did Perkins go to war with England? Was it more useful for destruction? You know, we can talk about the outcome, but what was the outcome, right? Reconstruction was absolutely, absolutely hellish, right? We know that Lincoln um, was going to pull up on this this policy that the Republicans had, which is why he got killed. Uh, we can we can say it as it is, uh, address the uh, elephant in the room. 
that people don't ever want to address. But he 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 got killed because he he either went back on his um on his word or he decided to go a different direction. And so ultimately, that is what I want to brainstorm. I'm going to take you down that rabbit hole. <laughs> so, uh, it's kind of an interesting concept because it would imply that England. Um, England is reestablishing a lot of things. I should say it's that it's that intra intra Anglo fight. Um, you know the the revolution. Obviously, we can we could say the reason why I brought that up with with the the pack and the the boss of Brahmin is because that was an in in family fight, an in feud fight. You know, a family feud, and I think it was an accident. But it came at a time when power was shifting from East Anglia to New England. Um, and so I want to explore that more. But I wanted to talk more about it in case people have more questions. And if you have more questions, uh, you know, co please contact me, right? Um, I, I think you can message me through my YouTube. If not, I'll figure out how to, uh, you know, maybe get the comments going here at one point. Um, and so... Yeah, anyway, that's all I got for you.